Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today, Monday, August 1st, by, with, by two of my favorite election analysis, analysts, political analysts, Jay Cost, my colleague at the Weekly Standard, author of many important articles on what, the last three or four election cycles you followed very closely in real time, and two fine books on American politics, and Spencer Abraham, uh, Senator from Michigan, Secretary of Energy, political operative before all of that, extremely astute observer of <laughs> politics and elections, and so these are two of the best. Uh, we've, this is the, what, this is the fourth conversation we've had. We've been wrong basically yeah, three times in a row, so <laughs> let's see if we can do it again. Uh, <laughs> the point isn't being right or wrong, it's how you think about it, you know. <laughs> right. Okay, so here we are. I think it's, it's the Monday after the two conventions, uh, uh, 99 days, I guess, till Election Day. Uh, Trump and Clinton, the major party nominees, as has been evident for a while. Jay, where, where do we stand, basically? How would you advise someone to, what are the odds? What are the basic, basic structure of the race? Well, I would say, I mean, first of all, we're in uncharted territory where it's very peculiar to see a campaign with two major party nominees that, the, that a broad spectrum of Americans dislike. Um, you know, you wouldn't think that given the nature of primaries and caucuses where you have you, you win by winning votes. It's very surprising to have two. Now, sometimes oh, that's literally true, right? That's, literally, we true. just haven't had a situation. Not that both candidates above 50 percent. Right. Unfavorable. Yeah. Now, oftentimes what will happen is uh, you will have, you know, bruising primaries will damage the reputation of, of, of nominees. And then the other thing that will happen is when a nominee is settled, you know, the op opposition comes to dislike uh, the, the other party's nominee. But this cycle is unique in that the, it's a very broad base of independent voters and soft partisans uh, don't like either candidate. So soft Republicans and independents don't like Trump. The independents and soft Democrats don't like Clinton. And what is the implication of that? More, it, more volatile, I suppose. I, more volatile. Um, I think that it, it just puts us in uncharted waters. Um, you know, where this is, we've never really had an election, I don't think, where people are going to, the, the winner is going to be the person who more people held their nose to vote for. Um, we've had elections where, you know, like 1976, Jimmy Carter was sort of a fresh face, 2008 Obama, people took a chance on somebody that they liked, but this is going to be people taking a chance on somebody that they know and already don't like. <laughs> or in Trump's case, also another way, which is just uncharted, and I guess this is a question, Spence, how, how much the kind of normal patterns and analyses even hold for this election. We've never had a nominee who hadn't held elective office. We haven't had that since Eisenhower. Uh, so that's also hard to know how Trump plays. I yeah, suppose. I mean, I, I think Jay's right in terms of being in uncharted waters and, and, and so on. And, and I think what, what I guess what I think the race is likely to come down to is whether or not Clinton is more successful in selling in effect that, that Trump's not prepared enough, doesn't have the right mindset, temperament, and so on to be president versus the argument that Trump will have that things in Washington are badly broken and desperately need a new type of an approach, somebody who's totally divorced from the political system, not beholding to the usual figures in Washington or around the world, uh, and that'll be the, the that'll be the contest, I think. I mean, surely things can happen that could change that dynamic, but right now that's sort of the dynamic. Clinton, the the, the you know the the insiders insider uh, arguing that Trump's unfit. Trump, the outsiders outsider arguing that that the country's on the wrong track in need of change. And one or the other of those is going to ultimately prevail. I mean, I, we were in the first Bush White House and. Uh, before 1992, you then went to run the Congressional Committee. But um, I guess the lesson I took from that, but tell me if to what degree I'm overstating it or it needs to be corrected, is in a change environment, in a two to one run, wrong track over right track environment, pollsters say, you know, is, are we going in the wrong direction or the right direction? I think it's now three to one wrong track, but I think it was two to one even yeah. in, in Bush 92. Being the candidate of change, being the challenger, the outside candidate, is a big advantage. I mean, the wind really is at your back. and. Now, you can disqualify the challenger sometimes, I suppose. He's just not up to the job. You can't take the risk. But don't you think the change, I mean? Well, I think it's why the race is not where the experts expected it to be. I think the experts have written Trump off all year uh, because they have not provided, really, you know, accorded enough uh, uh, credibility or, or, or legitimacy to his, his outsider message or really take into account fully the degree to which people are disaffected. 
and so so obviously uh, it, it is a, a, a big factor it, it could be the decisive factor and that's why I think Clinton's campaign is, is not going to be about uh, what she can do what she's going to try to do what's different or what's going to be different but rather why Trump shouldn't be allowed to be president and that's that's kind of where this thing strikes me as headed because I, I given the I mean in in one sense this is a unique race because I think the American people feel like they know both of these candidates very well I don't think either is going to make much of a impact in terms of changing the perceptions of them uh, so it's going to come down to you know is is uh, his outsider message and wrong is the wrong track more powerful in, in vote influencing voting or or not yeah, it's about Trump, right? Isn't that interesting? I mean, don't you think both Trump's campaign is about Trump and his message, it seems to me, and Hillary's campaign is about Trump and how he's not right. suitable and fit. I mean, it's, a, it's kind of unusual to have the whole campaign be about the challenge, the, out, the outside party, I think. I mean, yeah, 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 I think it is. Uh, but, but that's, I think, how the dynamic probably plays out, unless un unexpected developments, uh, you know, inter intervene. Well, you know, Trump has uh, his convention speech, I thought, was very poorly delivered um, and it wasn't very well edited, but it did contain within it a very powerful message, which was uh, the phrase, I am your voice. Right. Um, and I think that Trump and has tapped into uh, a sentiment, you know, you mentioned a moment ago, right track, wrong track numbers. Um, and typically, when I think about right track, wrong track numbers, I think about the state of the economy and the money that people have in their pockets. But I think that there is, among Trump voters certainly, uh, a sense of cultural displacement, where they feel like they were once in charge of the country, more or less, or that the people who represented them in Washington shared their views, shared their worldview, and now they no longer think that. <laughs> so I think a great example of that, we've seen that with the... Um, uh, the violence that's popped up in places like Orlando and San Bernardino and you watch what Trump does in response to them is he calls out Islamic terrorism and he calls it out by name and mocks the Democrats for talking about gun control I think that this is a small example of a bigger message that he is trying to convey which is not simply that Washington DC is broken and that it's not working but that Washington DC has become an interest on itself and it's a culture unto itself and the representatives in Washington don't have any affinity to the voters back home and that Trump has that affinity and I what really struck me I think a really great example of this was in the New York primary Trump won every county in New York except for Manhattan County uh, but meantime uh, he won Staten Island by the largest share of the vote in any county he had carried to that point. And I think that that's sort of the core of his appeal, the sorts of people in Staten Island who look over across the waterway and see that big city and see and think to themselves that the people in that big city resent them, even though they're the firefighters and the policemen who keep them safe. Um, it, there's that sort of cultural mutual resentment that Trump has been trying to exploit since he became an, a candidate and the question is uh, in number one is can he effectively exploit it and then number two a lot of it'll come down to which side is bigger you know wh which side of the culture war is bigger yeah well I, I think that's true I mean but but remember people in Staten Island are part of New York City right and they look across to Manhattan and the firefighters and people who keep them safe live in their neighborhood they don't live over across in the in the you know the gleaming skyline and and they, I think there's a growing sense that that the that the business leadership, uh, as you said, and the political leadership, uh, you know, doesn't care about them, regardless, you know, of of which Washington uh, insider is president. And and I think it's, it, I think there's a, a a large block of people that crosses party lines, crosses gender, crosses ethnicity, crosses race, etc. That just feels like there's something really wrong in the country, and I think they're they're irritated because I think they believe people in Washington on all sides aren't taking it seriously, and what Trump looks like is somebody who takes it seriously, and he may not get it all, and he may be sort of unconnected to some degree in terms of how Washington and government work, but he sounds a lot more like he appreciates the the magnitude of these people's fears, and I think that's. You know, traditionally, you, you you know you see these polls where they the Democrats tend to.
to get a higher response on which which candidate do you think understands problems of people like you. Uh, I don't know that that'll be the case when it comes election day. I think people think that Donald Trump probably you know yeah. understands their problems pretty well. And the Democrats have nominated the perfect foil for Trump <laughs> in that regard. That's an important point. Very actually. good point. Yeah. yeah total status quo candidate. Somebody who has been plugged in <coughs> and has been at the apex of American culture and politics for a quarter century. Yep. Yeah, in a year that's right, a year of change and, and, and literally the wife, the same last name uh, of a president. This Jeb Bush didn't do well against Trump and you could argue that Hillary Clinton won. Now yeah. she is ahead in the polls. Now it seems four, five, six points maybe as the bounces from the two conventions settle down. Um, I'm curious, I want to come back to one thing and ask about the polls too, but how much do you, Spence and I have discussed this for years, how much do you think sort of typical political analysts are just misreading the election? Like the convention speech is a good example, where everyone didn't like it, and I didn't like it watching it. It was 75 minutes of Trump yelling these kind of one or two sentence sound bites, you know, kind of sixth grade level kind of, you know. But I was struck, so I drove back from Cleveland to D.C. the next day and stopped a little bit in Southeast Ohio and then a the couple times in Pennsylvania just you know, to get coffee and went down to the local papers in each place, uh, these different coffee shops. The headlines were all um, Trump colon, uh, uh, I'm, I'm with you, I'm for you. Trump colon, I'll be your voice. Trump colon, I'm the law and order candidate. And I thought, you know, it can be very misleading. You, you grade these speeches the way a, someone who's been involved in politics or a journalist would. Is it well constructed? Does it have a nice, you know, peroration? Is it coherent? Is it elegant? But if you get radio, and then I was listening to the radio driving back too, and you get all these snippets on the radio, and it was all these one or two sentence formulations like that. And I thought, gee, I mean, there are a lot more people who will get that, or as many at least more probably, who get the, the news of the speech from those snippets than from having watched it all the way through. I think that's a pretty effective message in this context. So what is Hillary Clinton's message? Is it stronger together? I mean, what is that? Yeah. It just sounds like something. I actually thought Trump's speech was highly effective. Yeah, see, and, that's interesting. Uh, my reaction was, you know, that he that he did what he needed to do by and large. I mean, there were some things I think he should have tried to do just in terms of addressing some of the questions about his temperament and fit. I think there were ways he could have maybe addressed that to <coughs> assure some <coughs> of the softer Republican supporters. Uh, but I thought... Even in the way he handled, uh, you know, the issue of, uh, uh, you know, the event in Orlando, that he tr he, tr he did try, you know, to right. to demonstrate a, a sensitivity, but I think, you know, you think back, you know, what are the what are the, the big moments in convention speeches, and I'm sure, you know, on on the the grading of the journalists and the commentators and the uh, academics that I'd like Stevenson probably gave two tremendous, <laughs> you know, <laughs> speeches. But the, <laughs> the most memorable line of recent nominating speeches, uh, one of the most, was read my lips, no new taxes. Hardly a, you know, a, uh, an erudite statement, <laughs> but it, it really was a very significant difference maker in 1988. And I thought Trump's speech pounded home the themes he's he needs to, to to use to win with, and he may or may not win. If you if you think about who he's well, the votes he's trying to get, I think one of the problems the commentators have is that they they have this year, and we all have done it, and all three of us on these sh these shows before have looked at it as if like we and our friends are the electorate that's right. up for grabs, and we aren't. That's I right. mean, the electorate that's really up for grabs uh, is is you know, a little different this cycle. And I think it's one to which uh, Trump's speech probably appealed reasonably strongly. I mean, 88, I think, is very important because it was the last time a party held the White House for a third term. And how did, and Bush was behind Dukakis, because usually you lose the White House after two terms, mm -hmm. even with Reagan being pretty popular. Um, and how did Bush do it? I was thinking about that. He, uh, he, gave, a, he gave an effective convention speech, partly muted his, you know, a little bit of distance from Reagan, but then that very stark contrast with Dukakis, which was a contrast with Mondale and the Democrats generally, no, no new taxes. And then they really disqualified Dukakis. The, you know, the Ailes Atwater attack on Dukakis was awfully effective, culminating in I guess, the first debate or second debate wherever where Dukakis, you know, had that question from Bernie Shaw and just looked ridiculous. So, I mean, I suppose if you use that analogy, Hillary doesn't seem to me to have been able to, what is she running? I mean, at least Bush, there was a little bit of a kinder, gentler, but still no new taxes. You know, that was okay for some swing voters who might have been inclined to take a chance on the other party after eight years. But, you know, but they really, the key was, I think, the, 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 the uh, attacks on Dukakis. I don't think Hillary Clinton has given much of a positive reason. Has she to vote for her? I mean, that really, you know, the speech, 
and that's really striking. No, what, I is, mean, what is her agenda? You I know, mean, I think you, Trump's his law and order, mm-hmm. build the wall, yeah. renegotiate the trade deals. You know, she's all over the map. Policy. Her speech was all over the map. Trump's speech was sort of, you know, the problem with Trump's speech was he, you know, had a hammer and pounded a nail for 75 minutes. Hillary was all over the map. I mean, it what's was a her li- message? I think that's the question. Wh- exactly. Well, what's her well, what message? Is, I, no, I'm asking, I mean, really, what I mean, would you if say? You, if so you go he, back and look at the... Does she if, need a message or just needs to disqualify well, I mean, that's Trump? A cha- the, you know, and that's the thing, though, is that in a lot of respects, I'm not sure that they understand the Trump phenomenon over there, just as, you know, to be frank, we didn't understand the Trump phenomenon right. five months ago. You know, because you appreciate this with the array, the endless array of celebrities uh, that the Democrats paraded on stage. And, you know, I mean, is there a, is there an easier way for a party to make itself look like it's out of touch with the concerns of average Americans? Um, and then Hillary Clinton's speech seemed to me to just be a smorgasbord of ideas that she didn't, she didn't follow them through. So the stronger together thread, but then she you know that was that was mixed in it, and it, I thought, okay, well, she's going to run like a Nixon '68 style campaign of, or a Harding to 1920 campaign. Like we're just going to everybody, let's just relax. We're all together. We're all America. But then she injects this, you know, strident liberalism talking about the Supreme Court. She injects that, and then she, you know, she goes after Trump. So in a very aggressive fashion, which you know, all of these things, you know, if that's the campaign that she wants to run, but. Everything just seemed to fit together without, you know, like all of those things were focus grouped, very clearly focus grouped as being effective. But what did it add up to? What What's the message? I'm not sure what her, their message is. And I don't know how much credibility on some of these issues she has. I mean, uh, let's leave aside the emails and all of this. I mean, you know, Obama certainly rode hard on the, the, the whole argument about uh, bringing the country together and that he, that was it, you know, he was a unifier and so on, and he's not governed that way. And, and certainly the, the, the Clinton enemies list approach to, to politics likewise, I think, has, has really diminished the, the plausibility that that's something that she will successfully do. I, I, I think her convention also, and this is an interesting contrast with Trump, uh, you know, she she trotted out, you know, night after night, uh, the people who more than almost anyone represent, you know, the sort of uh, uh, business, cultural Washington uh, establishment, uh, whether it's Michael Bloomberg, New York, Leon, <laughs> Panetta, right. uh, you know, Biden and, and Bill Clinton and Nancy Pelosi and even Harry Reid was brought out for, you know, a sort of you know, final uh, uh, speech. <clears throat> so, so I think it, it tremendously underscored that that I don't think she can or will break or be perceived to break from, uh, you know, the business as usual. And I think Trump, strangely enough, because a lot of Republicans f- just forewent the convention altogether, didn't have this cast of characters so much uh, available to him. But in some ways, it again sort of cast him not as you know, the, the, the inheritor of all the things Republican that voters have rejected in recent elections, but rather is a, a little different kind of, of candidate. And so, um, you know, I think that, that does set up this, this kind of uh, choice we talked about already. He does have to reassure people, though, that he's not Absolutely. crazy, right? Or that he's not just well, erratic or, you know. Yeah, like, I mean, and I think uh, uh, he has to reassure some, <clears throat> but I do think there, there, are, there are a lot of Americans who feel like Washington political world is made up of people who trim and, and, and tiptoe and don't say what they believe and have fallen into this PC mindset where you know they're uh, not telling the truth. And the one thing Trump probably enjoys is a high level of, of confidence in the American people that he's, he's saying what he believes. Now maybe that kills him ultimately because some of the things he believes are not going to be palatable. I, I don't know. But I do think that that to some degree there's a, a, a higher expectation of disaster than really exists when Trump is is out being Trump because I do think it's you know it is uh, by a lot to a lot of people a refreshing change. He's also going to have to withstand um, a, a, an ad barrage that it's going to be similar in content to what the Never Trump forces 
uh, tried, but it's going to be much, uh, much more substantial. That the the Never Trump people they started in Florida and they had mixed success. Florida wasn't unsuccessful, but it was successful in Wisconsin. Uh, my guess is that the Clinton people have probably been working on this problem for a while. But this is the idea, right? The core message of Trump is that I'm your voice, right? I'm with the little guy, and he has an affectation that makes one think that he is. But he has a very extensive business record uh, that often cuts in the other direction. And even if it didn't, I mean, Mitt Romney, for instance, uh, was by all accounts a, a generous and decent businessman, good human being. But you can take snippets and portions and you can take business transactions out of context and blow them up. This is, I think, a big reason why we rarely see uh, businessmen run for uh, elective office on this level because you, you know you think oh, I'm a businessman I've created jobs this is going to help me but the opposition will run an ad talking about all the jobs that you cut Trump is going to have to deal with that as well and he's going to be substantially outspent by Hillary Clinton in all likelihood and he, he's going to have to maintain this so this message that he actually is with you so it's not just a question of can he seem like he's not erratic but you know, the narrative could be flipped. You know, Clinton could turn him into the villain, you know, make him out to be like a, a heartless, soulless corporate raider, which is what they tried on Romney. And if you look at a guy like Mitt Romney, who's a nice guy, that the Obama people were able to make Mitt Romney seem like a soulless corporate raider is is a tell that, you know, this is this could be a problem for but Trump. Could they do it again? I don't know. I'm no, I don't think so, because I don't think Trump's pretending to be Right. You know, something nice else. Guy. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I think he's, you know, I think he'll, I think he has, he's proven that when he's attacked, he attacks back pretty forcefully. Maybe not wisely. I don't know. But, you know, I think, you know, what, when Romney hurt himself with the 47%, uh, you know, remark that was taped at some event, uh, I think it, it automatically caused a lot of people to, to, you know, to see him differently. I don't think Trump is, you know, I don't think anybody's under any illusions about what Trump is. And, and that, you know, I think that, that is a, a, a way he might be able to address it. But I think Jay's right. On, on the normal campaign situation, uh, there's, <coughs> there's always some chink in the armor of people who have run businesses, mm -hmm. whether it's a layoff or it's... Uh, uh, you know, some kind of uh, allegation against the employees that somehow s sort of filters up to the CEO because you ran the ship. Right. Normally, it's a source of vulnerability. But people, uh, you know, I mean, look, there's nothing that Trump, in my opinion, ha you know, hasn't, uh, you know, is, people don't, they know who he is. They know he's a guy that ran the beauty contests and the apprentice and all these kind of things. I don't think, it's like the, um, the issue of his taxes. Uh, I don't think Trump will release his taxes and I think there's not one person in America who doesn't already believe that A, he made a lot of money and B, he probably didn't pay very much tax. And I think in spite of that, they're, you know, they're sort of, I, so that's why I, I think some of these issues that normally could hurt might not be so damaging. And do well, you the, think the normal advantage of paid advertising and ground game that presumably the Clinton team will have is less important in this kind of context? Well, I would or have said it? it was going to be very important, but for the place we've gotten ourselves to in this campaign. And what happened in the primaries, where he was heavily outspent, but more than made up for it uh, just by being, you know, a ubiquitous figure in the media, uh, proved that maybe you don't have to have a big edge. Um, we'll see. But, uh, but certainly so far, he's managed to withstand being heavily outspent and negative ads against him and things of this sort. And uh, uh, it may well be that uh, we've entered a new era in American politics. You know, the one thing which we should talk about maybe after the election is, you know, just how much has social media and no, new sure. forms of information altered so dramatically the playing field in terms of how voter make voters get their information and make up their mind uh, that, you know, we are now in, a, in the kind of era that, that that the uh, political world found itself after television became uh, the common form of uh, uh, evening uh, entertainment in America. I mean, it's just a different, it may be a different world. And if it is, then maybe it doesn't hurt Trump as much. I don't know. And also being a celebrity, don't you think, just they do get judged by different standards. I mean, and he is somehow a celebrity different from Mitt Romney or your standard politician who can get attacked for this or that or that or that vote or this business decision. I mean, I'm not 
say this is a good thing. Maybe this is a side of decadence of the po political system. Yeah, no, but, you but, you know, it does well seem be. like the stuff just doesn't, he's just treated differently. It's like, well, he's famous, he's exciting, he's fun to watch, and we're ignoring all these, you know, things he says. I don't know. Well, I think that the turnout operation, voter mobilization stuff is going to be very important for Hillary Clinton. And I think one of the, uh, the, the in my mind, one of the main unanswered questions is the extent to which she can deliver the Obama 2012-2008 vote, uh, which included a substantial increase over historical norms among African American voters. Um, and by the way, and this is this is why it's a question because in the midterms in 2010 and 2014 that vote uh, decreased again. Uh, and also, Obama didn't just manage to increase turnout; he also managed to um, shift about five percent worth of the black vote from the Republicans to to himself which amounted to about 40 percent of his total margin over over McCain and I think even a little more over Romney um, and it's that to me is a huge question and whether I wouldn't call that mobilization in the traditional sense of the word of sort of like uh, getting people to the polls or things like that phone calls and contacts but more of Ob can Obama communicate to this this base group of his loyalists right because he still is he still draws 90% approval from the African American community, which is an extraordinary figure. Can he, and I, I think he's going to have a very active, very vigorous role during the final weeks, maybe even more of the campaign to try and deliver this vote to Hillary Clinton. Um, and that's going to be something that's happening sort of off of the traditional campaign radar of the back and forth, the fight over independent, unaffiliated voters, because this really is about maximizing the number of basically non-white Democrat, you know, stalwarts to come out and vote and vote for Hillary. Yeah. I don't know, though. I mean, not sure they're... That's... Is, the, yeah. The, I mean, again, you've got a, a very different race. Right. <clears throat> and I'm not sure that, you know, that that constituency will feel that motivated uh, at this point. I mean, that could change, but right now, I, I wouldn't be... I think, you know, those, those, uh, those numbers about wrong track probably include a fair number of people who are, uh, you know, minorities. Right. And, and will they think the Republicans are their problem? Maybe. Will they think Trump is a Republican in the conventional sense that they need to get out and stop? I'm not sure. I mean, I think he's offered a lot of things that that are so unusual and different that he, you know, they may not, you know, they may not be for Hillary Clinton at the level they were for Obama. Yeah, right. I mean, the Obama and voters, I mean, I met personally various people who had voted for Obama and said they were going to vote for Trump. Well, and, and that's what makes me think that there's a hidden, not hidden exactly, but maybe more of a hidden Trump vote than people think. Well, and Obama has there. never really successfully turned the loyalty to hi to him into a broad mandate for his party. You know, and it's not just the 2010 and 14 midterms which are an indicative of that, but also, you know, organizing for action was supposed to be some grand political network that was sort of to revolve around his person that just fizzled out. There's, there's also another factor which I, I'm just, this is total speculation on my part. That's great. But I do think in, in, in both parties uh, there is a, um, a sense that uh, that whoever wins this election will be a one-term president. Hence, I think on both sides there's going to be a lot less of a motivation to to to, to win uh, in the way that normally you would have if if uh, you know that weren't the case. If people really saw it as a uh, a two-term, eight-year uh, outcome, I think both parties see the other. With given the unfavorable levels, the other the right. other side is offering somebody that might win this time only because we've found somebody equally unfavorable uh, and won't win again. So I think that cha that may change the, the, the ardor uh, of the, the troops. I, I've been struck out. by people I've run into who, yeah, it's, we can take a gamble on Obama. He'll shake things up. And I say, well, really? Isn't it like risky to have someone there who's just shaking things up randomly? And with Trump, you mean? I mean Trump, I'm yeah. sorry. Trump. And uh, with, you know, and without much of the way of guiding principles, and well, you know, the system can take it, and he, we need change, we need change. Now, maybe they will ultimately convince people it's too risky, I guess that's the, the real question. But, and, he, you know, she is probably, Hillary Clinton probably is ahead now, so maybe uh, we're overstating a little bit how much, uh, what, what Trump's chances are, but um, I'm a little, just the, the, the right, the wrong track change environment, it seems to me, is such a, which he does have a great sense for. 
uh, and she's running against, she has to somehow persuade people not to go in the direction they naturally might want to go. And also just the third term, you know, I mean, historically, yeah. the one thing it's held ever since, I think, for 100 years, right, is the, the third term effort always gets fewer, considerably, has a considerable drop off in vote from the second term. The re-election, you know, whatever Reagan gets is, you know, 60%, yeah. Bush goes down to 54 I mean, just Clinton gets a nine-point margin, Gore goes down to zero. You know, there's always that drop off in the, in the, in the third term effort sometimes you even sometimes you lose the White House and Obama only was at 51 percent I mean is Hillary going to do better than Obama well maybe because Trump's so unacceptable but on the other hand they can't afford to give away that many votes you know I mean the the political the journalists talk as if the Democrats have this huge natural majority but it's not that big is it I mean it's not and I this see I agree and I and that's why I thought the Democratic convention was meticulously produced and was very was very good spectacle, but I thought it rang a discordant note. Mm. That the convention seemed to be this up with people kind of things are great and and look, it's just it's frankly not true. You know, um, Ob Obama's reelection in 2012 was unspectacular, and before the rise of Trump as a foil, he was. Uh, he wasn't the most unpopular in the sense that uh, more Americans disapproved of, disapproved of him than anybody else in the in the in the history of polling. But his job approval rating had been under 50 percent longer than any other president up to that point in their term. Um, and, and people don't like Obamacare. The economy is not going as well as people want it to be going. There's a sense of drift in our for and the issue of foreign affairs. Uh, and I think that. You know, these high profile shootings have people spooked and, you know, the, the Democratic convention was, you know, hey, things are great and we're better together. And yeah, it just to me, it just rang it, it just rang a false note. And I don't think that it, it is consistent. And it, it's an interesting juxtaposition with 1988, right, because George H.W. Bush basically ran that sort of convention, you know, a thousand points of light and, you know, but times were good in 1988. We had peace. We had prosperity. Uh, people were generally happy with the status quo. They wanted more of the same. And George George Bush, his job was to sort of focus that kind of, um, you know, stand patism around himself. And Hillary was trying to do the same thing, and, and to me, it's uh, you know. Well, did I she have any choice, though? Really, I mean, you're no. But I, I think I think I, he's exactly right. Uh, but the history of you've never had it so good uh, conventions or candidates trying to win when people don't think <laughs> that that's the condition uh, usually doesn't come out so well for them. Usually, that you know, people start saying, "Wait, wait a minute," you know. Uh, uh, I have had it this good. I've had it better than this. And, you know, with anemic growth numbers, with uh, attacks, whether in the United States or abroad, happening with regularity, with dangers in the streets, and this, you know, uh, recent uh, series of killings, uh, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a message that, that does not resonate. And, and, and I think it, it, but I don't think she has much of a choice. I don't think she can run on an anti-Obama uh, right. uh, administration, and, and she's, she's hemmed in on the left by Sanders people and Warren, people like that. So I think she does have a, that's why she probably doesn't want the race to be about what's going on in, a, in the country, what's been happening in Washington, or herself. She really does have to run, as you said earlier, Bill, I think, a campaign about Trump. And, and so what would you look for as the key moments? I mean, you never know, of course, in campaigns, but we basically have almost two months now before the first debate, August and September. I think the first debate is very late September, and then they're in pretty quick succession. Um, and then he's striking, a, I don't know. A, a, a domestic terrorist attack on a soft target, I think, would be a hugely politically impactful development. Um, and we've had, you know, in the last year, how many we've had? Two or is it three in the last year, you know? Depends on what you count as. With. You know, but what about more, like, you know, actual event? I mean, do you think the, the debates matter? Some well, the first do, debate will be a, a, a terribly consequential debate. You think it will be? I do. One. I think it will be the most heavily watched debate uh, probably in history, or certainly it will rank at the, up at the top, notwithstanding NFL football competition. Right. Um because I think people view, I think people will view it as a, as a, as you know, both they really want to see Trump and how he will perform. They'll expect fireworks, and it'll be a big time wrestling kind of environment uh, and and entertaining. Um, and I don't think people 
quite yet know. A lot of people certainly don't quite yet know which way they're going to go. So I think it'll be. I think the first debate will be immensely important and potentially the others, but the first for sure. And I, I think that what I'm going to be looking for at that first debate, I mean, one of the advantages that Trump has as a candidate is a lack of shame or something <laughs> to that effect. Um, and now let's suppose that, that Ted Cruz would have um, won the nomination or Marco Rubio or any of the others. They would have gone after Hillary very hard um, in that debate. They would have thrown Benghazi in her face. They would have thrown Libya in her face and thrown all sorts of things in her face. Trump is going to do it in a very rough manner. Um, it is going to be a sharp attack. And I think that one of the differences between a guy like Trump and one of those people is that he's not going to be embarrassed by that, which is always sort of a danger when you go on an attack. Like I recall um, in the primaries where Jeb Bush went after Marco Rubio for um, not for not attending the Senate. Jeb seemed vaguely embarrassed by that, and Rubio was able to sort of stick him with that embarrassment. Trump is going to sell those lines, and you know I think like for example the 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 uh, families of the Benghazi victims. Um, I think that that's the sort of stuff that a Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio he wouldn't mention their names in a debate. I expect Trump to do something like that, maybe repeat the names, say them again and again. Very rough. But what about Hillary's chance to just discredit Trump? I mean, he said all these outrageous things, and you know. Well, you know, the debate I'm thinking back to, and I only have a vague memory of it now, is her 2000 debate with Rick Lazio, yes. mm -hmm. where she was able to end up uh, as a sympathetic figure with right. Lazio, presented her with some sort of uh, ultimatum or document right. that he wanted her to sign, a pledge of some sort. Uh, so she's, I suspect, will we'll look for a chance to gain a similar advantage. Uh, I just don't know if in the modern sense of political debates and television coverage of them, uh, it'll work as well. But I, I, that's the thing I think Trump needs to, to, to go to school on and be prepared to deal with because I think, uh, as, as Jay said, he's going to be much, I mean, his, all of his inclinations will be to be very rough. Uh, and she's going to have to work very hard to not appear to be, you know, a, um, you know, to get into it with him so much. I, I think she, she'd be better off trying to present herself as somebody who's cool, calm, collected. I mean, that's who she is, and that's who she should be. If she gets right. into it with Trump, it may go, may still end up in her favor, but I, I'd, I'd say that's a much more risky course. Yeah, debates are, um, she's not the best, she, she's not the best debater, but she is, a, she's a better debater than she is a public speaker. speaker. Um, she's very smart, and she's very quick on her feet, and she's good at um, rebuking, somebody will toss a line at her, she can get her way around a line, especially prepackaged lines. Uh, one of her weaknesses, I think, as a debater is that she's such a trimmer that you know, oftentimes she'll want to have things both ways and she can look kind of absurd in, in those efforts. But I expect her to, you know, give as good as she gets in, in that debate. I think it's going to be a very intense spectacle. But it will be interesting to see whether Trump, like Reagan, in the 1980 debate with Jimmy Carter is able to close the gap between how uh, the public perceives his preparedness uh, and, uh, uh, and in, in, in his performance. Uh, Reagan had, had a pretty much even campaign, even race with Carter going into the debate. Uh, the one thing holding back a lot of voters was the sense that maybe he was too dangerous, uh, that maybe he was too unprepared or unfit or, or too too ready to uh, you know to launch wars whatever and he was able to, to prove that he was quite the, the opposite of that Trump has to sort of do that I think if he does he could do he could come out of the debate in pretty good shape because yeah, the think challenger I think is always the one who has to prove that he's yeah up to the level of the president or in this case the yeah Secretary of State and uh, who worked for the current president of, of his party right it is really, uh, I mean, it's funny how much the election is about Trump, and he's such an unusual candidate, you know, like him or not, and I don't like him, but nonetheless, it's very hard to just analytically figure yes. out, yeah. you know, how it plays out. Maybe it's like 88, maybe it's like 92, but, uh, you know, there are many, 68, there are analogies, but there's nobody what like, other things should we I, think about? Well, I mean, look, to, to your point, months? you know, if you look at his, if you look at his record as a businessman, nobody does business the way, I mean, it's always about Trump. It's always been about Trump. You know, 
uh, I mean, so well, but he wants it to be about Trump. Exactly. But that's different from Trump made his. But that's different from a race being about. Right. That's very unusual. Well, Trump Trump made his fortune in the 1980s, right? When a lot of people made very large fortunes. I mean, Trump was able through a, a skill set that is. It's easy to um, mock the skill set. It's easy because it's not a, it's not a noble skill set. But he was able to trans translate personal wealth into an international brand and to uh, turn himself into a celebrity just based on his wealth. Now, and that's the trick about Trump is that Trump was f regularly featured on the pages of the New York Post, but not the Wall Street Journal. Right? That's that. But elections and Trump Trump understood this, I think, in a very intuitive level and has understood this. While we've all been scrambling to figure out what's going on, I think Trump understands that the New York Post is the one that the swing voters read, so to speak. But the reality TV thing was very important. Yes. I mean, hugely, hugely high important. Rated show well, for 14 help, years. Helped him you know, rebrand himself. Had, people think Reagan was a famous actor, but he wasn't that famous by the time no. he ran and he was governor of California for two tours before he ran for president. So we really don't have much of an empirical test at the presidential level of a Well, Trump has been a celebrity for, in this country for decades. Right. I mean, whether it was right. in, you know, the original Trump buildings or it was the his plays in sports or it was, you know, his... Or the girls, the, the women. The, you know, Marla Maples oh, right. or whatever. Uh, and he does have a comfort level in that zone. I think as to what might be inflection points, I, I'm assuming uh, the White House will look for ways to, to help and that, you know, whether or not they can and how well Trump and the Republicans parry that will be important. Um, I think both candidates, I, I, ex I think he, both sides could play unexpected cards that could that could change the dynamic, uh, you know, and, and uh, we'll see. I mean, I, I, you know, we've talked before about, uh, tr you and I have at least, about Trump perhaps uh, making a one-term commitment, which could alleviate some of the concerns of people who may not want him for eight years. I think Hillary Clinton, likewise, if she, if I were advising her, I'd say, uh, if you want to bring over a lot of these uncertain Republicans, make a commitment that uh, for every two justices she appoints to the Supreme Court, she appoints. She lets the Republicans appoint a third, wow. and take that issue off the table to some degree. It might. Re it might really uh, for Republicans that, that I talk to who are uncertain about Trump. They talk about the court. Maybe you neutralize that. I mean, there's there's strategies. I think that right. we may come to see play here. She's not usually that imaginative in her. Right. Well, strategy. I shouldn't have said it then. Maybe. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a good one though. And he is. And this is where I do think he has more upside, probably more downside too. In the sense that he could get just crushed. If he just turns out to be, you know, people just decide he can't be president, and I think you could have that, and he could lose by a ton yeah. of points. But, but he also has a more upside in the sense that, like Reagan in '80, if he just can cross that barrier, of yeah, I think I can he's be okay. I think the one-term pledge would be smart for Trump. I mean, because I do think the fear that he'll be kind of a dictator and ruin the country. You know, he says, I'm going to go there one term. Well, this was your idea originally. You wrote this up. Uh, I guess we wrote this up uh, about a month ago, right? I mean. You, you, yeah, one term, fix what has to be fixed, 24-7, no politics, no fundraisers. It would be an attractive thing, right? Yeah. No concern. I'm not going to be one of those people worrying about the interest groups. You know, right. it's a good, I'm going to do good the things that are unpopular that have to be done, and the only way is if I don't have a, uh, a, a to worry about a, uh, you know, re-election. This is, this is Any another... Any other wild cards Well, we this is another at? example of the differences between them as candidates where they're, they're both unpopular, but they're so different that Trump is, you know, one of Trump's problems is is that he's a big picture guy uh, exclusive to almost everything else. So he never, it's obvious he's never read briefing books or tried to study up on policy and things like that. But, you know, he has, he has a view of the grand scheme of things and is able to do innovative things. Like, for instance, the, uh, I, I, I was, I was found it repellent, but uh, the, the call to ban um, Muslim Im immigration was a very crafty view of the big picture in American society. And it really helped him overcome Ben Carson and jump out to first place in the, and he never really looked back, frankly. Yeah, that was a key moment. That was a key moment. And I mean, it's a, it's a it, in that sense, I think, Jay, you're exactly right. And it, it is where he and Reagan, you know, sort of have a, a common right. uh, uh, sort of uh, political approach. I mean, Ray, nobody thought Reagan was, you know, hitting the briefing books. In fact, he was ridiculed for years for, not having grasps and of the intimate details of issues, but he was right. 
fairly it, masterful at, at standing for three or four things that the public both agreed with and, and, and believed he would do. And it's something that Hillary Clinton distinctly lacks. Right. Um, Hil you know, because, of course, Hillary Clinton is, I mean, she's a nepotism candidate. You know, she was elevated to this position because her husband possessed this talent. Her husband was able to understand the dynamic in 1992 figure out on an intuitive level what people wanted to hear and offer that to them. And he was, from that perspective, from that place, able to launch her career. And she had every advantage in 2008, except she has a lack of vision, which Obama possesses on an intuitive level. And I think, you know, we were talking a little bit ago about her convention and her convention speech and how it was a smorgasbord seemingly without some unifying vision, because that's not the sort of candidate that she is. Um, so that's a real contrast moving forward. I think Clinton's campaign is going to be strictly by the numbers, strictly by the books, because that's her comfort zone. And if there's going to be wild cards or something coming out of left field, it's going to be from Trump exclusively. Anything else? Electoral college, vice presidents, all the, all the things people obsess about, do those matter much? or? Do you guys think this will be an election that will yeah, I think be? this probably won't turn much on the, the vice presidents. In fact, uh, these may be the two least covered <laughs> <laughs> least interesting. figures. I mean, you know, they were it's each ridiculous. selected in, in a way to, you know, to address, uh, you know, uh, anonymity or blandness or the whatever. Right. I'm not sure they are that, but they right. will be treated that way because the, the, the nominees will draw all the, you know, all the heat. Um, so I don't know. I think you've got five or six states that look to be very much in play. Uh, but do you buy the argument that he's Trump scrambles the map because he's more attractive to sort of? I think at the margins voters? he could Maine. He could scramble the map in Maine. Uh, Pennsylvania, Pencil Michigan, where you're from. Michigan and Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, I think yes. In, in surprising places in Pennsylvania, like I see him, you know, he he's going to do well in northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, how well? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, you know, Maine, because it allocates con uh, electoral votes by congressional district, he ha might have an opportunity to poach Maine, too. That'd be too. funny. If there'd be oh, that'd be interesting. One vote margin. Yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. yeah well, like somebody college. had a map that came 269 to It's not impossible 69, but if way. you won the Maine seat, you win, you know. And, you know, I think, I, look, I mean, there's obviously, in contrast to, to Reagan's appeal to Democrats, Trump offers not only social conservatism, whether he's deeply committed to it or not. Uh, and he offers, you know, the sort of, if you would, uh, you know, law and order uh, security appeal. But what he has that Reagan didn't have is also an economic agenda that is much more uh, connective to the uh, Reagan Democrats, to the blue collar Democrats that, you know, Michigan has large numbers of, as do Ohio and Pennsylvania. And uh, it is interesting when you listen to his speech. I mean, if you were sitting in, you know, nobody told you which convention it was. Right, I agree with that. But if you were sitting in your living room back in some time pre-television and all you heard was the, the, the speech. If you were a, a union member or a, a blue collar worker, whether union or not, uh, you would, I think, find almost everything Trump was for to be very uh, much your agenda. Let's let's reduce immigration to help keep American jobs. Let's have better trade packs or get rid of them because we're losing jobs to, to, to cheap foreign work. Uh, I'm gonna keep, let you keep your guns and you're not gonna be threatened by that. I'm going to make sure your streets are safe. Uh, what's not to like if you're uh, the, you know, the sort of Reagan Democrat voter in Macomb County, Michigan or Duluth, Western Penn, Duluth yeah. Minnesota, or Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, yeah, they had an awful lot of middle class, upper middle class voters who are like put, so put off by Trump's well, that's, character. Well, that's the that's the flip so side. And you look at a place like Pennsylvania, get. for instance. That's the flip side. You know, he it, it, it's going to do him no good if for every one voter he flips in Scranton, uh, he loses two in Berks County. That's not going to do him any good. So that's the question. And what do you guys final question? If you had to put the uh, yeah, so what have you said earlier? Sort of depends on the actual numbers that, uh, total in the country, or in the key states of these two groups, so to speak, that Hillary's trying to appeal to and Trump's trying to appeal to. What's your instinct? Where would you put the odds for the election? Pretty close. I think. Uh, uh, I think right now it's very close. I think you know you have an inherent advantage to Democrats in the electoral college as people talk about it, but it's uh, 
I th and and I think that 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 maybe Clinton has the advantage, as Jay's referenced, in terms of more resources for turnout. But I think there also could be some some hidden Trump votes uh, of people, and they, they would be, I think, more your your sort of suburban upper middle class uh, voters who are going to end up voting for Trump may not tell pollsters what they're going to do, uh, and uh, or say they're for Gary Johnson until the last week. But uh, so I think very close. I, I, I you know. If there's a so you think the conventional view, which is ultimately Hillary Clinton wins and probably pretty easily, you think that's too right too now complacent. I mean, there, there's always the possibility for you know a you know self immolation, but I think right. in the absence of that, I see very close. What do you think? Uh, I think that um, you know I think Trump, uh, you know it's it's sort of it's going to sound pat to say it, but I don't mean it that way. I mean I think Trump could win. And by that I mean what we've been talking about, if he were to do the things that we were talking about, like, like Sp Spencer said, you know, come to the debate and, and sort of calm people down, show a grasp of policy or things like this. Um, he, if he did those things, I think he could win. Um, but I don't think he will. I think that um, ultimately Trump is a man who is uh, consumed by his passions, that he lacks a certain discipline that I think has... Uh, it's already manifest, and I, I, I think that if, if he were to do those things and show that kind of discipline um, and really knuckle down and, 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 and focus on his message and delivering his message in the most effective way, I think he has a potentially powerful message, but I, I don't think that he is capable of doing that. I think it, much more likely he's going to, con he, he'll sort of gesticulate wildly, um, and I think he's too easily knocked off course uh, by personal offenses, real or perceived. Um, and I think that, I, I think the best example of Trump's weakness was after the convention. And as you said, it was, you know, it was not a good speech to sit through for 75 minutes, but in the newspaper and in sound bites, it sounded great. And the next day, he's talking about Ted Cruz's dad and John F. Kennedy. Why? What is the advantage of that? It was simply personal peak, is what it was. He was offended and he lacked the capacity to control himself. And I think that that is ultimately going to be his undoing. It's my guess. Well, I guess we will, we will see. It is amazing how much we've talked about Trump and Clinton personally. And barely mentioned the words Republican and Democratic. I think that probably does capture something unusual about this campaign. These two figures yeah. are so famous that they've, and they're also, in Trump's case, such a peculiar candidate in a way that they've transcended the normal party conflict. And yeah, well, and in his case, he's been largely uh, right. shunned by very right. substantial figures in his party, which hasn't hurt him in a way. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? And there's a grand irony here, too. You know, people are not happy with the status quo. They think that Washington, D.C., and uh, you know, I, you get this sense that people are very aware that there's a hierarchy in American society and that this hierarchy runs contrary to the principles of Republican government where all men are created e equal, and as Lincoln said, government is of the people, by the people, and for the people. You know, there's this pervasive sense that that has been violated on a profound issue, on a profound level. But here we have two candidates who have been perched atop the socioeconomic hierarchy for a quarter century as the yeah. major party nominees. It's extraordinary. Yeah, it's a very unusual yeah. year. So someone's going to win, and... 99% chance it will be either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. So let's walk through what does the world look like politically after that? One has the sense this might be more than the usual. Well, one, one party wins, the other one loses, and you've got to go about business, right? I mean, give us what, what begin with whichever scenario you want. Okay, well, there's four, really four outcomes, uh, you know, a, a close win by one or the other or a, or a, or a big win by, by uh, a party. And I think in the case, uh, first of all, I'll say that I believe that, that the likelihood that whichever candidate wins will be a one-term president's very high. I think the likelihood that, that either one, if elected, gets challenged uh, in their primaries mm -hmm. is very high. Uh, because I think both of them have been, um, up till now, doing a lot to try to mollify uh, in Trump's case, conservatives, in, in Hillary's case, uh, Sanders and, and Elizabeth Warren, uh, and those wings of the party. And they're both going to govern, I think, much more moderately because I, I don't think they, they adhere to these views. And I think they will disappoint and likely draw uh, resistance, more likely in Trump's case, but, but in either case, I think you'll see that. <coughs> I think for the Republican Party, 
if Trump, uh, <coughs> I think if Trump loses, particularly if he loses narrowly, the finger pointing and accusations will be, uh, I think, a, a, a source of rupture. <laughs> that could that could really cause the right. GOP to not be able to capitalize on being the out party in 2018. I mean, if it's a big loss, there's not, I don't think, within the Republican Party, a unique uh, group of people that are, you know, uh, the, they're diehard Trump supporters that will, you know, will be rallying at that point. I mean, I think he, he is sort of a, a phenom of his own and and so on. But in a close race, I think you'll have a lot of, of, of GOP di division, uh, a potential rupture in the party, uh, and, uh, and, and, and that could have real ramifications in 2018 in races that I think the Republicans will be uh, favored to win. They, they, could, they, they could be in jeopardy. And I think on the other side... Would you have Trumpite challengers, challenges against Oh, I think there'll be, if he wins, there'll be, I think if he wins, there'll be imitators for sure. Uh, and I think we can only, we can only imagine the, the sort of people who would visualize themselves as Trump-like truth tellers, right? you know, with small or large fortunes who might enter the political fray if he wins. If he loses, maybe not so much. Uh, if Clinton wins and, and the Democrats capture a narrow victory, uh, I think 20, uh, that, uh, you know, it'll, it'll be a little different story. I, I think she'll have a very hard time in both 18 and then in re-election. Uh, but if she wins large, I think there, there, there really exists, uh, she'll, she'll work hard to co-opt a lot of the Republicans who will have helped her do that, uh, particularly in the business and, and donor community. And I think for the Republican Party down the road, that could be uh, significant uh, 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 defeat uh, going forward because I think now against that I'll just say that we've seen uh, in the case of big wins uh, a, a fairly you know interesting pattern that usually the next election to everyone's surprise the party yeah. that got drubbed comes back pretty strongly uh, I think that Democrats might I think the Republicans if they're beaten badly could have a hard time coming back just because the this campaign has been run and in a, in a fashion that's that's alienated a lot of people. And, and, well, that, and that gets to the question of win or lose, I guess, how deep are the splits in the Republican Party? Is it, does it become, is it back to the old Republican Party if Trump loses? Is it a Trumpite Republican Party? Is it a split Republican Party? Is there a new party? I don't know, you know, it's a good question. <coughs> um, I think that at least as, as regards moving forward, the outcome, you know, I think one of the things that is very likely um, is we'll have divided government of some sort. Uh, if Clinton wins uh, by a very large margin, this sh should probably be enough to sweep the Senate along with her, um, which will help her secure the Supreme Court justices she's looking to install. But I, I doubt that it will sweep the House along, which means that her legislative agenda is going to uh, struggle because, you know, sh if, sh if the Democrats, if she has some coattails, she'll sweep the marginal House districts um, and ironically sweep out the moderate Republicans who would be most inclined to go along with her. So what you'll have is a narrower Republican majority that remains at least as conservative as it ever was. And I think that that's something that Obama didn't have to struggle with as president, because when he was elected in 2008, he uh, what, enjoyed an overwhelming majority and they got Arlen Specter to flip so that they could eliminate the filibuster as a threat. And I think that Obama is still enjoying a kind of halo effect from that period uh, because he has been because they passed Obamacare and he's been able to go back to his base and say, you know, uh, we've we've uh, we we changed, you know, the first election 2008 was, you know, uh, change the guard. And then subsequently, it's been about guard the change. Um, and so he's been able to sort of deflect any a anger on his base for, you know, just the institutional barriers towards policy reforms in our country haven't really, you know, the Sanders voters, their anger isn't really directed against Obama in that regard. Uh, I think Hillary's going to have to deal with them because I don't think that her legislative agenda is really going to go anywhere. Uh, and if it does, if something does come through, it's going to be in a form that is going to be very disappointing frankly, probably to everybody, because that tends to be what our system does. Now, Trump, I think if Trump were to win, it'll be a different story. Um, I think that Trump, on the one hand, will probably, if Trump wins, he will have a Senate majority and House majority, but he's not going to have enough of a majority in the Senate to overcome the filibuster. I don't think that that's in the offing. But I think with Trump, 
you know, one of his one of his challenges is that you know whatever parlance or sort of you know whatever uh, you know he's got this sort of rhetoric of trade protectionism that you know sort of works with the average Republican voter. There is a substantial free trade block in the Republican Congressional Caucus. And they're probably, you know, they're keeping their mouth shut right now for the sake of, you know, uh, a re-election in 100 days. But they are not going to go quietly into that good night on the issue of free trade. They will never, the, the, and, and now he will have, there are protectionist Republicans, you know, uh, Marino from Pennsylvania, and you know, well, he would have Democratic votes. And but he'll have he really Democratic. try to do that. I can't believe it. Was he going to really try to change an after in a fundamental way? I and mean, that would be a question with Trump. Well, that's that's the reason I, I think that that he'll be challenged, and there'll be challenges for Clinton too, because I think they've run in 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 a way that helped them get nominated, but n won't necessarily adhere to that. As far as where the party goes, you've asked, I think, an important question: Is this can the Republican Party be the same again? And I think, uh, I'm, I don't think so. I yeah. actually think it needs to change, probably. Uh, what Trump's success and the success of some of the others in the primaries demonstrated was that you can't run on the Reagan agenda forever. Uh, in the same way the FDR agenda, after 36 years in 1968, began to deteriorate and fall apart. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that you know it's been 36 years since Reagan uh, you know, was elected, and I think at that point it's pretty hard. I mean, the, the issues have changed. This, the, you know, the concerns of, uh, you know, of a of a Cold War are now a different type of concern, and the, the 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 tax cuts for a lot of people have happened. And now, when you talk about Republican tax cuts, you're not talking about ones that have mass appeal, but more narrow appeal. And and so, uh, so I think that you know that hopefully this election demonstrated to the what I will call the traditional conservative community that, that you can't keep running on the Reagan agenda and think that our only problem is that the, the, the messenger needs to be packaged better. You really do have to, you know, I think take the strongest elements of the Reagan agenda and, and of course still stand for a strong national security and for civil liberties uh, against big government and all of that, but you need to put them in contemporary times and I don't think the candidates have been doing that. I think they've tended to run as if uh, you know we're stuck in history somewhere 20 years ago and that just isn't the, the if they don't do that then you really will see upheaval. I it seems to me on the Republican side I mean there's total chaos because you can't uh, on the Democratic side I would say there's more more radical and less radical versions of big government welfare states you know uh, liberalism or democratic socialism but I don't know that there are qualitative differences really between Hillary Clinton and Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and you can imagine fights on a lot of things <coughs> but that's a party actually I'd say with a more coherent view of the kind of America they want I think the, tr the Trump Trump and your standard Republican and Paul Ryan don't have a common view of the America they want. They're radically different, opposed to each other on a lot of big issues, and not just in sort of particulars, but almost in their whole vision of how politics should work. The Tea Party was about the Constitution and the rule of law. Trump's not about those. So you have three or four, there's, there's you know, different cross-cutting cleavages in the Republican Party, I think. You know, think of Cruz, Trump, and then the more establishment ties, Mitch McConnell, Paul Ryan is not quite the same as either of any of those other three. I think the Republican side could be totally Chaotic. I don't know if it's more chaotic if Trump wins or loses. That's an. I think if, it lo if he loses in a way, you get a certain kind of come together against Hillary, yeah. and maybe you try to replay 2010 and 2014 and 2018. I'm not sure it works, but I mean, maybe that would be the. Don't you think that would be the instinct of them? I mean, that's yeah, what, that's and the, I think a big the question. easier default. <laughs> yeah. But if Trump wins, I think you could have. I mean, literally, Paul Ryan would be against most of Trump's big well, policy proposals. Look, right? I, 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 mean, I, I mean, I don't mean that in there I mean, is a right or wrong. I'm just saying, Paul Ryan thinks we should have criminal justice reform. Trump thinks we need to have more law and order. Paul Ryan thinks we need to have free trade deals with Asia and with Europe. Trump thinks we should renegotiate look, NAFTA. Paul Ryan thinks we should have moderately liberal immigration policies. Trump thinks we should build a wall. I mean, it could be pretty crazy to have a Republican president, a Republican Speaker of the House, fighting on, on, on about everything. Trade Russia, is a very you, dangerous NATO. issue for the Republican Party. In my opinion, the trade issue is something that where I think that a wide swath of the Republican base is skeptical of free trade, but free trade is a basic commitment of the Republican leadership class. And I think that historically speaking, what Republican politicians have done 
uh, is, you know, what George W. Bush did, for instance, was sort of proclaim a general sort of commitment to free trade, but then very publicly, you know, pursue anti-dumping claims on behalf of steel, the steel industry, things like that. They sort of, you know, but they were pretty uh, pure. They, they they you were the senator from Michigan. I mean, the fact is the Republican Party was so orthodox on this, for better or worse. Right. In this case, I would say better, actually. But, I mean, you ran, I believe, as a supporter of NAFTA yeah, yes, in do. Michigan. Rob Fortman runs as a supporter. Right. I, mean, I guess now he's not quite a supporter of TPP, is he? But, I mean, basically, he's a pro-trade guy in Ohio, uh, Toomey in Pennsylvania. I mean, it would be a big deal for the Republican Party. It would I be mean, very to, messy. To turn on trade, in my opinion. It, I think well, so. Well, I don't yeah. think they, that's the thing. I don't think they can turn on trade. I think that if Trump, you know, if, if trade is the centerpiece of the Trump agenda. Well, I don't think it would be. Well, if, let's just assume, let's, yeah. I mean, he. I guess he could pass things to Democratic votes, right? Well, I mean, I mean that's the thing. And, it, and if, if the sum total of his trade agenda is, is toward protectionism, then that is going to, then he, he'll either fail at the hands of his own party or he'll succeed with Democratic votes. I mean, could Trump Democratic be a sort votes? of post-partisan president? That would be sort of interesting. I yeah. mean, that would be Trump's instinct, right? The art of the deal. Well, you know, I'll get Democratic votes on this one and Republican votes on that one. Yeah. He won't be a conventional George W. Bush where you call in your own Republican leaders first yeah. and try to agree on your platform and then you try to win over a few Democrats. I mean, Trump is perfectly capable, I suppose, of having Democratic majorities and Republican minorities on some issues. Well, and you have to wonder what happens within the caucuses if he wins. Because there might be a school of thought that says perhaps the leaders of our caucus need to be a little more comfortable working with this president right. and more in line with this president and uh, you could see change. I'm I not mean, saying Ryan seems to think that Paul Speaker Ryan seems to think that Trump's gonna enact the Paul Ryan House entitlement reform and Medicare reform agenda. That does not strike me as Donald Trump does not think he's going to Washington to enact Paul Ryan's Ryan unpopular <laughs> entitlement reforms, much as I love them, and you know, yeah. think it's important for the country, right? I mean, that's not, yeah. Well, I, and 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 look, has there ever been this much disconnect as a kind of historical matter? I'm just thinking between the pro Republican or either party's presidential wing and congressional wing. That's if you close your eyes and listen to a Trump speech. Listen well, to a Paul Jimmy Ryan Carter speech. had a lot of, uh, Carter, of Carter troubles had that problem. Uh, with, uh, right. with the Democratic with Congress. With in fact, and, uh, but, but Hillary know. does sound more like Pelosi, who and sounds more like Bill Harry Clinton. Reid, who sounds more like Chuck Schumer, who sounds more like Tim Kaine. I mean, I think they're in the same ballpark. Well, Trump's not going to be like these others. Trump is just different. So really, you know, I guess it's extremely is, hard to predict. Different. But I, so they'll they'll maybe have to say where can we agree and work together and start right. with that part of the agenda, and then you know as we move yeah. ahead we'll find areas where maybe you have to find a different coalition. well that would be the challenge too is that the, you know bill clinton passed um nafta with you know which was, was not popular with half his party but if you look at the the package that clinton put together in 90 93 94 nafta was balanced with you know increased spending in a stimulus and and yeah, gun control clinton passed in 93 there was there yeah, was he passed, pure a, well, partisan he passed vote. a welfare reform right. he or he signed a, the welfare reform legislation before his re-elect that yeah. was certainly not popular yeah. with the right. and NAFTA in 94. So after he passed on a pure partisan vote, his budget in 93, right. Right. he then, after losing the 94 election, went to the Senate. Right. But right. in 93, NAFTA was an unpopular piece of legislation with a wide swath of the Democratic base, but it was balanced with other pieces of right. legislation that, and that was the Clint Clintonian triangulation. Right. right. And if you were, if you were going to take the Trump you know, if Trump wanted to follow that, right. you know, you'd start off with Obamacare, right? And that's probably something he, you know, that he would be able to work with the Republicans and, and like and address. Pick I mean, different and, issues and, and, yeah. and oh, you mean appeal to replace Obamacare? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Together. I mean, start there, and yeah. then and then you know, and and probably could get an immigration uh, consensus among Republicans with with something. Maybe not everything he wants, but he might be able to move there, even Tighten if the Ryan is not fully on board. Right. I mean, I suppose, yeah, this is a, um, this has been very interesting, actually, and in sort of one, so when you start, I mean, it's hard, of course, to think these things through ahead of time, and when you really start thinking about the dynamics, certainly with Trump as president, it's pretty, that, as we've said before, pretty uncharted difficult waters. Too, yeah. I mean, with Hillary, I suppose it's a little more conventional, a lot would depend on whether they control the Senate, or conceivably the House. The House. But what about the fact that both parties, and I am struck by the fact, 45% of the voters so far in 2016 voted for either Trump or Sanders, almost the same number in each party. 
um, who were both, I think it's fair to say, outside of the, and I don't say this whether this is good or bad, but outside the mainstream of their own parties and of both parties, <laughs> you know, policy views and sort of attitudes, you might almost say, towards how to conduct policy over the last three, four, or five decades, really. It's pretty unusual. I don't really recall. I mean, we've had times where one party goes in a very different direction, you know, the gold order insurrection of the Republican Party that were governed in the Democratic Party. But for both parties to have such big insurrections at the same time, uh, and that that high percentage of the American public is dissatisfied with, you know, the, let's say normal American politics, is, depending on how you think about it, it's either disturbing, I'd say that, or, or maybe it's, you know, hey, it's a, new, it's a new day, it's a chance for people to rethink well, normally things. Well, don't you, don't you normally you have a situation where there's, you know, there's some, some specific uh, thing, the Vietnam yeah. War, uh, the Carter e economy, et cetera, right. that can cause, because <coughs> you had that in 1980, I mean, you had right. Ted Kennedy got... Well, that's a good Almost point. half the Democratic so votes, yeah. and the Republicans certainly had Reagan and yeah, other surprise. What you have here, though, is you have a much the same kind of alienation factor without there being a, a specific single basis on which it's 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 been uh, developed. And uh, but that is to, to me the answer to that is it's Washington, basically that 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 this is all really reflective of an anti-Washington sentiment that is reflected in the wrong track numbers. It's reflected in, in you know, any kind of, of polling that asks about how well things are working, the approval ratings of Congress and so on. Uh, I, I think, frankly, but for the <laughs> sort of strange way the elections played out, that Obama's numbers, as Jay alluded to, would be his approval rating would be much lower. But in a, in a kind of <clears throat> comparative world, he, you know, kind of has has risen here <laughs> against the backdrop of the options Americans see to him, but still, there's not affection for Washington. There's a sense of tremendous in, inadequacy here, and I think that's you know, and that's reflected in both parties. There, there's there's unhappiness that will be we'll see it in November, and that's what Trump's going to have to and have to November. I mean, I guess thinking more about it as we talk, it just seems to me that if you sort of circle back. It's hard for me to believe if Trump if Trump wins, the left wing of the Democratic Party will say that Hillary Clinton was the only human being the Democrats could have nominated who would lose to this lunatic. When Obama won twice, when the Democrats had won five out of six of the popular vote in five out of the six last elections, unbelievable that she could have lost. And I, don't you think the odds are very high that, I mean, these things are always unpredictable and there'll be a million back and forth and zigs and zags, but that, you know, Elizabeth Warren or someone like Elizabeth Warren is the nominee the next time. The, the party will go left. I mean, the left will have the upper hand if Hillary Maybe. loses, I should think. And conversely, if Trump loses, I think the recriminations will be very great in the Republican Party both ways. That's a little more, that's a little harder to figure which way that cuts. But it seems to be either party, the losing party will be in more than the normal state of existential. Yeah, yeah state of. Yeah, right, I think know. the Republicans, <clears throat> it'll be very interesting to see if, as was the case, um, I think after the 64 Goldwater election right. the, and after uh, uh, subsequent losses, how the governors on the Republican side ended up becoming a much stronger force. Now, they haven't so much been that over the last eight years, which is a little bit surprising and disappointing, I think. But I would think they would become, you know, the sort of uh, uh, you know, critical mass, if you would, in the in the party if they assert themselves. I hope they will. There's a a lot of Republican governors who are very popular and who have run on agendas that are pretty, you know, conventional, strong, conservative uh, agendas. And I think they need to really step up. You saw it, I think, after 96, where a group of governors uh, ultimately okay. got behind George W. Bush and he became the nominee. That sort of got to happen, I think, on the Republican side to avert what, what you, you just outlined as a potential a problem. I think that... Um you know, th this is a very diverse country. I mean, it's always been a diverse country. Even in the 1790s, if you look at the way, I mean, people nowadays will be like, oh, well, it was all just a bunch of white men. But, okay, yeah, it was. But, there, you know, back then it meant something to be sc a Scottish versus English versus German. It's always been a diverse country. And it is today. And, and for all of this diversity and all the competing factions that we have, we have two parties 
which is a real tension. The parties do enormous work in our system of government by taking this sort of variegated factions and corralling them into two that then compete for the offices. And it's always been a struggle with our party system. And our party system has frequently, you know, um, ha had a gasket blown. Um, I mean, that's one reason why political patronage was so popular during the Gilded Age. It was a way to contain factional disputes. Just give this side the jobs and they'll be quiet and they'll vote for the ticket. And, um, you know, it's also one reason why party organization and party nomination processes were so closed. As it was a way for the parties to control the options that voters have. Um, and over the last 40, you know, half century or so, We've opened these offices up um, so that now parties as organizational entities are more open to being influenced by the broader public than ever before. Um, and I think that that's what we saw in 2016. And so you asked whether or not it was peculiar for uh, both parties to have this, and, and it is. And I think that um, it's part of a story of, you know, we talked in the previous segment about the right track, wrong track numbers and how bad they are and you know you only get down to right track wrong track at like 25 percent if a huge portion of both sides is unhappy with the status quo and in our system now the two parties are not immune to swings in the public mood whereas 100 years ago 150 years ago they were immune they could be they immunized themselves but they're open to changes in the public mood and uh, we saw that with the bernie vote and with the trump vote uh, where the parties are no longer, I don't, and I'm very disappointed in that. As the Hamiltonian in me, I guess, I don't know. But I prefer to see the parties exercise uh, control over limiting the options that the, that, 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 the, that are available to the public and constraining. The parties are so weak. I mean, Hamilton wasn't the party guy, but the, Hamilton, the parties are so weak. They're it's incredibly I mean, weak. kept saying during the primary yeah. process, one of the party leaders is going to get together. It's, it's not how it works. The parties like, are luck, weak because you know. we've created an election financing system in no right. small measure. It's the result of McCain and fi Feingold that, that took the power and diminished the power of the parties in exchange for, I mean, unanticipated perhaps, but empowering interest groups and individuals Those. who had large amounts of money. Uh, so it, there, there isn't that, that kind of leverage the parties once had, maybe a little more on the Democratic side, but definitely on the Republican side, uh, you know, the, the, the party leverage is... is, is That's why I wonder whether it just couldn't also... I mean, I, the two-party system goes way back, and there have been a lot of times it's teetered, or they've been third parties for one or two cycles, and it, they diminish or go away. But. I really wonder what's holding it together. And obviously, first past the post elections historically, most countries the parties, tend the, to lead towards right. the two parties. And the parties are able to but, um, but restrict they don't control, ballot access. Well, but they don't. That, that I think is going to change. Because yeah. the truth is, I looked at it this year with the independent candidate. If you started in 2017 and said you wanted to have the Jay right. Cost Spence Abraham party, modest resources, a couple yep. of donors, That's right. you got 50 ballots. All of that. It's not very hard. Right. And then the question is, and this is what Trump shows, if you're a celebrity, if you're famous, or if right. you have a lot of money and can buy name ID, but especially if you're famous for some reason or other, um, how hard would it be to run in some states right. as not a Republican well, or it not gets a Democrat? Back, would it really hurt you, you know? It gets back I to mean, the I mean, that would be the question to me. Could you really have either a third party or just have a lot of independent right. candidates in a very different system? It's not like other countries haven't had that in the past, or we have. Right. You don't have to have two parties that, as you say, internally broker well, right. you're, a you're, lot you're, of interest You're group. close to a four-party system right now, in a, in a way. I mean, you know, you're, you know, you have within the Democratic Party some, some pretty, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders, you know, was about as... Right. personally weak a candidate as you right. might have out there but there was there was there was resonance to his message and it's a very different message than the the Bill Clinton Bob Rubin Hillary Clinton right. traditional democratic message and Trump's message you know it's very different than the Reagan message and and so you have you know a uh, right now some in each party some some definite factions do they break into four well, if they were going to, <coughs> this would be the kind of moment for, for several reasons. First, because financing parties or candidates has become easier for a small number of people to do again. Second, because the means of communicating to voters has no longer you know, filtered through a small number of media elite organizations. 
So if that was ever going to happen, you you do now have the, the 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 potential for it to. I'm not sure it will, but I'm just saying I think you you could be right. And Finding it a big issue or a crisis or yeah. session. Uh, well, or I I think that you know parties exist because they're useful to 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 political candidates, right? So the parties in Congress I think are really stronger than they've ever been in a lot of respects. Um, notwithstanding the sort of the backbench revolt of the Republicans, but even that itself is the sort of sentiment of the party. You know, they want the party to really flex its full muscle. And, and because party organization in Congress is extremely useful to members of the legislature. But party organization in Congress is different than party organization within the electoral sphere. And also party identification as being uh, an emotional, you know, intellectual affiliation. Right. And, you know, those sorts of things, and Spencer, you were talking about this, the evolution of campaign finance and the general degradation of party controls over its own um, you know, ballot, you know, nomination process itself, that it, it's fair to start wondering, well, is the party itself really all that useful? I mean, as a matter of fact, if you wanted to, you know, if somebody was looking to blow up the two-party system and on, on the presidential level, start an initiative to turn electoral college, change it from winner-take-all to some sort of proportional system or winner-take-all by congressional district and throw elections into the House of Representatives. Because really, right now, that is the key uh, bulwark that the parties have is that the winner-take-all on right. the electoral college. If you And by the way, it wasn't always like that. If you go back, you know, 200 years ago, that is not how states allocated their electoral votes often. Um, if you were to change that, you could very easily see the parties break up, at least on a presidential level. Because not, not just not just that, but... I think like, of California, like, too, even at the state level, if you went to a nonpartisan top two right. primary, you could and suddenly think, have a much more personalized politics. And more yeah. broadly, you know, if you're a candidate for office, and, you know, both parties, the reputation of both parties... Uh, a net negative view. If you want to run for president, why affiliate yourself with a brand that's damaged? Well, you know, well, if I win the nomination, I'll get this big $50 million convention. Well, great. That's like a five point bump that lasts for a week. I mean, at what point it do, you know, if you're an ambitious person like, you know, we were talking a moment ago about Donald Trump running and, you know, I, and I had the thought at the time, uh, you know, if Donald Trump were to win and to govern in a way that alienates the Ryan caucus, you know, I could see Trump running as an independent for re-election in 2020. I mean, why not? At that point, what's he need? Because if there's anybody who could break the two-party yeah, system, it would be an incumbent president of the United States. So I think that on a national level, uh, not so much on a congressional level, but on a national presidential political level, the party system is in, ver is in a very bad way. Interesting. Yeah. Well, that's a good image. Donald, Donald, a depressing image for me. First of all, we have Donald Trump as president. But then the excitement of him running as an independent in 2020, I guess. That would, it's for re-election. Yikes. <laughs> well, we'll do many conversations between now and then and <laughs> analyze what's happening. We'll have to do one right after the election to see what happened and but what its implications are. But this last conversation, this last part of this conversation, for me especially, was interesting. And uh, I guess I hadn't really, most of us probably haven't had much time to think about what happens after November 8th. And, the degree of uh, uh, that that also is uncharted waters is what's striking to me. You know, yeah. we're all sort of used to, if we've been around Washington a bit, the new party takes over or the old party takes over, and this is what happens, and you can sort of visualize it. But I think it's very different, certainly if Trump wins. <clears throat> and if Hillary wins, different, because I think the Republican crack up then could be yeah. pretty, pretty amazing and substantial. And I think you'll have people running a, already for 2020 quicker than ever right before. Right out of the game. Yes. I don't think. Because of the one term. Bill into yeah. it that she's yeah. vulnerable. Well, yeah. Also, she almost never win after 12, you know, you yeah. can't hold the White House for 12 fourth, years. A fourth consecutive term, I mean, you have to go back to 88 to find a third consecutive yeah, term. FDR. FDR. So, FDR. Yeah. You'd have to find a fourth one. And, that, and they're both 70 years old almost, yeah. so that would be also. Yeah, yeah. no, so I think it could the, be interesting. Yeah, it'll yeah. be a horse race early. Good. A lot of for us to discuss in that. So, Spence, Jay, thank you so much for yeah, joining sure. me today, and thank you for joining us on Conversations.